Awesome. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome to tonight's Bible study going through the Gospel of Mark. Uh, thank you to everybody who is here live. If you're listening to this on the playback or the replay, I don't know the right word to say there, playback, replay. If you're listening to this after it's recorded, just leave a comment below. Let me know you're catching the replay. All right. So let me just pull up my notes here. We're going to get into this. And I'm excited for, for today's lesson. Uh, I've, I've spent a few days putting this together. Um, why is this not opening? That's not it. That's my podcast info for later. All right. We got it. I got it pulled up. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm a professional. I'm a professional. I got it. So uh, today we're going to read chapters. Of, uh, we're going to read Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through... What did it do? four through eight here. So we're going to read it real quick, and then we're going to get into this. So starting in chapter four, John came baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John wore a camel hair garment with a leather belt strap around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, One who is more powerful than I am is coming after me, and I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the strap of his, of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So, thank you, God. Thank you for your word. Let's break this down. Now, obviously, he's talking about uh, Jesus coming. He's, he's making the way for Jesus's arrival. So if you remember last week in Mark chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, we spent some time discussing how Mark attributed these Old Testament prophecies to Jesus Christ. And in doing so, he pointed to the fact that Jesus is God in the flesh. Now, these, these passages spoke about preparing the way for the Lord, a.k.a. Jesus, and the arrival of the King of Kings. So you'll see in today's reading that John the Baptist, the one preparing the way for Jesus, makes the claim that he isn't even worthy enough to untie Jesus's sandals straps. So John understands the magnitude of the one he is preparing the way for. He knows that he is preparing the way for the king of kings. And he knows this because he was chosen by God for this task. So when we think about preparing for the arrival of not just a king, but the king of kings, think about what would come to mind, right? Like what does that preparation of the arrival for a king even look like? Well, in ancient Rome, which is the time that this was all going on, whenever a victorious general or emperor arrived home, there would be something known as a triumph, which was a grand ceremonial procession held to celebrate a military victory or conquest. This is where we get the word triumphant. We have triumphed over something. You win a, a basketball game, you triumphed over the other team. Uh, that word triumph comes from this, right? So what does a Roman triumph look like? So there's eight points I want to point out. The first is the meticulous preparation. A triumphal procession required meticulous planning and preparation. The general or emperor would first petition the Senate for the honor of a triumph, providing evidence for the of their victory and the spoils of war. So there's meticulous preparation that goes into this. You have to get approval. We would look at this as like getting permits for a parade, right? Then you have number two, a carefully planned route. So the triumphal procession would follow a carefully planned route through the streets of Rome, typically starting in the Campus Martius or the Field of Mars and culminating at the Temple of Jupiter on Capitoline, Capitoline Hill. That's probably where we get Capitol Hill from, right? Then you have number three, the numerous participants. So this procession would include 
the victorious general or emperor. He'd be accompanied by his soldiers, officers, as well as captured enemy leaders. Troops would be dressed in their finest armor and uniforms with banners waving in the air and standards proudly displayed. So picture, you guys have all seen movies where a triumphant king arrives home. This is kind of what it looks like, right? So number four, you'll see the spoils of war. The procession would showcase all the spoils of war captured during the campaign, including treasures, artwork, exotic animals, and captured enemy weapons and standards. Standards are like the poles with the, the flags on it. Um, these spoils would be paraded through the streets as symbols of the general's triumph and the might of Rome. Number five, you'll see captives. Captured enemy leaders and soldiers would be paraded through the streets in chains, symbolizing Rome's dominance over its enemies. The captives might be subjected to public humili humiliation and abuse as they were marched through the Roman streets, while Roman citizens cheered and celebrated. Pretty savage, right? Then number six, you have ceremonial offerings. So the procession would include offerings and sacrifices to the Roman gods, particularly Jupiter, the quote unquote king of the gods, little g, gods, right? The general or emperor would offer thanks for his victory and seek divine favor for the future. So it would include worshiping their pagan gods and, and giving offerings to their pagan gods, which we understand are demons. Then you have number seven, the extravagant public celebration. So the triumphal procession was a public spectacle with citizens lining the streets to cheer and celebrate the victorious general. The streets would be decorated with banners, flowers, and garlands, and the air would be filled with music and shouts of triumph. So it is a huge huge party going on. And then number eight, you have the grand ceremony or the conclusion of everything. The triumph would culminate in a grand ceremony at the temple of the Jupiter of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, where the general or emperor would offer sacrifices and dedications to their pagan gods. So it's this whole event from beginning to end everything meticulously planned out, the triumph served to glorify the victorious general and reinforce Roman power and prestige and reaffirm the loyalty of the citizens of the citizens to the state. Is this type of extravagant procession anything like what we see in Mark chapter one, verses four through eight? Well, let's look at John the Baptist and, and and let's see if this looks anything like that, right? So for, we're going to highlight three aspects of John the Baptist's ministry, all right? First, let's look at John's activity as a prophet. And going through this can, can help us get a visual of what John's ministry looked like. Uh, I think I just lost my camera. Am I back? Am I back? All right, cool. Um, we'll get a, a view of what John's ministry looked like, and then we'll be able to look at that in comparison to this extravagant Roman triumph procession that goes on, and we'll see if they look similar at all, right? So number one is John's activity as a, as a prophet. We're going to just read this real quick, verses four and five. So John came back baptizing in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now, when it says the whole and all the people of Jerusalem, this is hyperbole. This doesn't mean every single person that was in Jerusalem. It just means a whole lot of people, right? So, Let's just look at this. So John's emergence as the final Old Testament prophet. So that's what John was. He was the final Old Testament prophet, John the Baptist. This represents the culmination of centuries of prophetic anticipation, making the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy of a voice crying out in the wilderness and Malachi's prophecy of the messenger preparing the way for the Lord. Those are the verses that we discussed last week. So his baptismal ministry signifies a profound shift in the religious landscape as he calls the people of Israel 
to undergo a ritual of repentance and purification in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. Now, this was very countercultural. You'll, you'll see in a second. By baptizing Jews, John challenged the prevailing religious structures and rituals, emphasizing the need for authentic repentance and spiritual renewal rather than mere adherence to outward forms of piety. And as we continue in our study of Mark, you'll notice that Jesus tends to bump heads with a particular sect uh, amongst the Jews known as Pharisees. These Pharisees were hyper-focused not only on keeping the law of Moses, but also keeping these hundreds of man-made traditions that are nowhere to be found in the Bible. So keep that in mind, that this was the culture of the time, was to strictly adhere to these man-made rules and regulations that these Pharisees created, right? So what John was doing stood in the face of all of that. So he was baptizing Jews, which is mind-blowing because the fact that he baptized Jews, because traditional Jewish baptism was mainly for non-Jews who wanted to become Jewish. This departure from tradition highlighted the universal need for repentance and spiritual renewal, regardless of ethnic or religious background. So normally it would be Gentiles who want to convert to Judaism that would be baptized. But now here, John is calling Jews, he's calling Israel to be baptized. So this is countercultural, right? Now, the reason is John's baptism emphasized repentance, symbolizing a deliberate change in thought and behavior in preparation for the Messiah's arrival. Traditional Jewish rituals often focused more on outward observance and adherence to religious laws rather than inner transformation and repentance. And this is another thing that Jesus called out throughout his ministry, is that you are outwardly, you look godly, but inwardly you're rotting, right? So another thing that John did that was totally countercultural at the time was he carried out his ministry in the wilderness rather than the established religious centers like Jerusalem or the synagogues. This unconventional setting underscored the urgency for and radical nature of his message, challenging the status quo and calling people to encounter God in the wilderness. So what John is doing is he's kind of spitting in the face of all of these man-made traditions and the Pharisees who thought they were better than everyone else because of their strict adherence to these outward appearances of being godly. But internally, they were just as broken as everyone else. They were hypocrites. Jesus called them hypocrites and brood of vipers, right? So they would do things in the synagogue for everybody to see. They, they thought they were good. So John, John the Baptist is calling Jews to be baptized, meaning having their, going through this ritual, which was for non-Jews. So he's saying to them, essentially, hey, all of those outward things are no good. You are just as sinful as everyone else. You need to come get baptized and repent of your sins. The, the Messiah is coming. And though that outward appearance of godliness, that's, that's not how this is going to go from this point on. So John was doing all of that just by baptizing in the wilderness, baptizing Jews in the wilderness. So... Number two, let's look at John's lifestyle as a prophet. So John's choice of attire and diet deliberately evoke the image of the prophet Elijah, signaling his identification with the prophetic tradition and role as the forerunner of the Messiah. So he was humbly living this way. His aesthetic lifestyle reflects a radical commitment to his prophetic vocation, renouncing worldly comforts and distractions in order to devote himself fully to the task of preparing the way for the Lord. He gave up everything, just and just this was his mission in life. He did not focus on anything else. So 
The wilderness where John dwells and carries out his ministry serves as a symbolic space of spiritual testing and purification, echoing the experiences of Israel in the wilderness and the prophets of old. So he's saying, leave all this fancy stuff. Come here. Get get purified, right? We also see, and we'll get into this uh, probably in two lessons, we'll get into Jesus going into the wilderness and being tempted by Satan, right? Now, number three, we're going to look at John's message as a prophet. Oh, I forgot to read the other ones, but uh, this is verses seven and eight. So he proclaimed, one who is more powerful than I am is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Right? So again, John's message as a prophet. So John's proclamation of the coming Messiah transcends mere prediction, right? He bears witness to the profound significance of Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John 1, 29. We're not in John, but what's beautiful is that all of these Gospels harmonize with each other, and you can find different aspects and, and different perspective by reading them all. And in John chapter 1, verse 29, you see that um, John refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So back to John's message as a prophet. So his humility in declaring his unworthiness to perform even the most menial of tasks for the Messiah underscores the radical nature of Christ's deity, his mission, and the absolute sovereignty of God's redemptive plan. So John had, remember we, we discussed what happens when you have a low view of Jesus and, and what happens when you have a high view of Jesus, which is looking at Jesus as God and how that radically changes how you respond to your, to your faith walk and, and your walk with Christ. So John knew Jesus and Jesus was actually John's cousin. But he's looking at his cousin, knowing who he is, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, the King of kings. He, even being related to him, says, I am not worthy to even bend down and unstrap his sandals. Now, continuing with John's message, the baptism with the Holy Spirit, which John foretells. So John is telling people that I'm baptizing you with water, but the one is coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So he foretells and points towards the transformative power of the gospel, wherein believers will be and are today regenerated and empowered by the indwelling presence of the Spirit. Through his message, John invites the people to participate in the kingdom of God by embracing repentance, receiving forgiveness, and eventually experiencing the new birth that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. So before we go looking and comparing this to the Roman triumph, what can we learn from how John lived his life? So one, we can look at our activity as believers. Like John the Baptist, we should engage in purposeful action that aligns with our biblical values. This may involve serving others, sharing your faith with others, loving others, and actively participating in efforts that bring about a positive change in people's lives by sharing Christ with them. Just as John baptized people as a visible sign of their repentance and commitment to God, we can engage in activities that symbolize our dedication to God as well. Many times when people are playing with the idea of Jesus and thinking about the truths of life and what the meaning of life is. And they they they're coming closer and closer to the kingdom and they're they're thinking about who Jesus is and, and why are people talking about him. They will many times look to people that they know are Christians and they'll analyze their lives to see if they are any different than the world. So it's important to you know be active as believers and to live on purpose, that we shine 
uh, as representatives and ambassadors as Christ, of Christ, as we discussed last week as well, being a good ambassador of Christ. So number two, we can take a look at our lifestyle as believers. Now, John's lifestyle reflected his commitment to his prophetic role and his reliance on God's provision. Similarly, we should strive to live with integrity, align our actions with our beliefs and values, and relying on God's provision. So this might involve simplifying our lives, prioritizing what truly matters, and seeking contentment in God rather than in material possessions. Just as, God, just as John embraced a simple diet and attire, we can cultivate a lifestyle of humility, gratitude, and dependence on God. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying you can't have anything good in life. I'm not saying that you need to go, uh, by good I mean like uh, luxury, quote unquote. Um, I'm not saying that you need to give up everything, uh, go move into the wilderness and eat locusts and honey. That's, that's not what I'm inferring here. But there was a book that I read called The Treasure Principle. Me and my wife read it. And it was about storing treasures in heaven instead of storing them here on earth, as we are um, advised to do by uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that you like have to go live in a hut somewhere and drive a car that uh, is like 32 years old and the wheel is falling off of it. That That's not what that is implying. It's just saying that if you have possessions, don't allow those possessions to possess you. Let's keep our eyes focused on what's important. And a lot of times we focus on what we can see, which is the material, when we, sh we should be focused on the invisible, on, on the spiritual things of life, which are way more important than the material things of life. Number one, focusing on Jesus. When you focus on him, everything else just falls into place, right? So number three, we can look at our message as believers. So John's message of repentance and forgiveness pointed people towards the coming Messiah and the promises of renewal through the Holy Spirit. Similarly, our message to the world should be one of hope, love, and transformation in Jesus Christ. We can share the good news of God's love and grace, inviting others to experience forgiveness, healing, and renewing and renewal in their lives. Our words and actions should reflect the transformative power of God's love, inspiring others to seek a deeper relationship with Him. So we can emulate John the Baptist's example by engaging in purposeful action, living with integrity, and sharing the message of hope and transformation with the world by aligning our activity, lifestyle, and message with our faith in Jesus Christ. We can effectively witness to God's love and reach people with the gospel. So John is a really good example of being sold out for the mission of Christ. Now, understand this. There was only one John the Baptist. There were only 12 apostles. Now, there was countless disciples, and we have countless disciples today. But I don't want you to think that you have to give up everything and just, and just go ahead in this direction. No, you are to be a light where you are. And in the space that you're in. It's not like, hey, quit your job tomorrow and go, you know, stand on the corner and preach the gospel all day and, and just rely on, on eating handouts. That's not, that's not what, uh, what we're inferring here. So there was one John the Baptist. So not everyone is called to be a street preacher. Not everyone is called to do Bible studies or, or, or have a YouTube channel. Not everyone is called... And, I honestly think like YouTube channels, yes, they're great. They help a lot of people. I've got a lot of value out of it, but it's nothing in comparison to somebody who was called to be a pastor in, uh, you know, the rural countryside of the Philippines somewhere. And they're just, I don't know why I picked the Philippines, but you know, they're just, they've given up everything to go just be a pastor at a church out there. There's, I think that like YouTube and content creators, yes, awesome. So glad that you're here, but man, we ain't got nothing on the people who are just pastoring small local churches, you know? But not everybody is called to be a pastor. So look at John's example and just see 
how you can reflect that in your life. If you do feel like you got to give up everything and go do that, then, hey, man, seek some godly counsel, get in prayer, and make sure that you make the right decision to go be eating uh, locusts and, and honey in the wilderness. But so anyway, back to the original question. Does John's preparing the way for the king of kings look anything like the extravagance of the Roman triumph? Well, after reviewing John's activity, lifestyle, and message, we see that there was nothing outwardly glamorous about it. He was, by all outwardly appearances, some weird guy in the wilderness dressed in camel hair clothes, eating bugs, and dunking people underwater. So if we only look at John and how he was living and his mission and his activity, we don't see the meticulous preparation, the carefully planned route of the triumph. We do see some participants, but we don't see any spoils of war or captives. We don't see ceremonial offerings or extravagant celebrations or grand ceremonies. All we see is John in the wilderness calling people to repentance and preparing the way for the coming Messiah. But that's just what we see. That's not what John sees. And that's definitely not what God sees. Now, the good thing is that we get to see the beginning and the end because God has given us the story for us to read. So as we explore the Bible and dig into it deeper and, and we read the entire Bible in its proper context, proper context, we see God's meticulous preparation and in how God preserved the lineage of Jesus's family, ensuring that he was born into the house of David as prophesied. Generations were meticulously guided through history from Abraham to Jesse to David until the arrival of Jesus. Additionally, God used prophets like Isaiah, Micah, and Malachi to prepare the way for telling the coming of the Messiah and setting the stage for his arrival. We also, we also see God's carefully planned route. God laid out salvation for his people. It was a predetermined path, just as the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus were part of God's divine plan for the redemption of humanity. Every step along the route was orchestrated by God to fulfill his promises and bring salvation to the world. We also see God's chosen and numerous participants. The participants in the Bible narrative leading to Jesus' birth encompass a vast array of individuals spanning generations, from Abraham, the father of faith, to the patriarchs, kings, prophets, and ultimately Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, the magi, each played a crucial role in unfolding in the unfolding story of redemption. Following Jesus' resurrection, the apostles and the early disciples and today's disciples, you, me, continue to play a part in spreading the good news of the king's arrival to the world. We also see the spoils of war. Jesus himself is the ultimate gift. The spoils of war bestowed upon humanity by God's grace is Jesus. The war between light and dark, and don't get it twisted, this war was lost the moment Satan rebelled against God. He It was an L. He lost it. But Jesus, through his birth, life, death, and resurrection, brings us spiritual treasures such as forgiveness, reconciliation with God, and the promises of eternal life to all who believe in him. We also see captives, but in this sense, we see freed captives. Jesus' victory over sin and death symbolizes the triumph over captivity. Jesus tramples death to set humanity free from the bondage of sin and the fear of the grave. Through his sacrifice, Jesus offers liberation and restoration to all who accept him as Lord and Savior. Now, the triumphal, the, the, the Roman triumph had 
their offerings to their demonic gods, but we have the ultimate offering to the one true God. Jesus is not only the central figure of this triumph, but also the sacrificial offering. He willingly offered himself on the cross as the perfect atonement for humanity's sins, fulfilling the requirements of the law and opening the way for reconciliation between God and humanity. His sacrifice and the offering of his blood is the ultimate demonstration of love and grace. And finally, we see an extravagant public celebration and grand ceremony. The public celebration of the triumph finds its ultimate fulfillment in the eternal celebration of God's kingdom. As believers, we look forward to an eternity of worship and rejoicing in the presence of God, where every tear will be wiped away and there will be no more death, mourning, crying, or pain. The everlasting celebration is the culmination of God's redemptive plan, where we will praise and glorify Him forever. There is no conclusion to this victory. It is ongoing, everlasting, forever. And we will get to celebrate and worship in the presence of our Lord and Savior for all of eternity. So, in conclusion, while John the Baptist's outward appearance and ministry may have seemed humble and unassuming, his role in preparing the way for the coming Messiah was part of God's grand and meticulous plan for the redemption of humanity. John's activity, lifestyle, and message pointed to the greatness of the one who was to come, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. So just as the Roman triumphs celebrated military victories, John's ministry prepared the way for the ultimate triumph of God over sin and death through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. Though it may not have appeared extravagant by worldly standards, John's work laid the foundation for the most significant event in human history. As followers of Christ, we are called to emulate John's example of unwavering commitment, humility, and bold proclamation of the gospel. Like John, our lives should reflect the transformative power of the message we proclaim, pointing others to the eternal celebration that awaits us in God's kingdom. As we continue our study, let's remember the significance of John's baptism of John the Baptist's ministry and its pivotal role in God's redemptive plan. May we be inspired by John's example to live a life of purpose, integrity, and unwavering devotion to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And let us go out this week sharing the good news of God's love and grace with, grace with boldness and humility, inviting others to experience the forgiveness, healing, and renewal that can only be found in the King of Kings. Easter or as I like to call it, Resurrection Sunday, is one of two times a year that people are more open to coming to church. So let's use this week to invite people to church. Because if they're more open to it now and at Christmas time, then invite them. Uh, we have, there's, there's, uh, we have, if you're in the, Connecticut area, I have a church you can go to. If you're in Puerto Rico, I got a church you can go to. If you're in the Boston area, I got a church you can go to. Um, you can invite to. Just get out there and invite, guys. And with that being said, I have some homework for you, right? This is a tradition that I do every single year on Easter after go to church. Sometimes it won't be directly on Easter. It'll be Saturday just in case we got a lot going on at church and with family. But Watch uh, Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. It, as intense as that movie is, it still fails to compare how intense Jesus's passion narrative was and, and, and what Jesus actually went through with all of us in mind. So that's one you could watch. Another one is this movie called The Case for Christ. Um, and... It used to be on Netflix, it's probably on Amazon Prime, but it's called The Case for Christ. It's about Lee Strobel, 
who used to be an atheist journalist and then went on a journey to try to debunk Christianity and eventually became a Christian. So that is uh, that is some homework for you guys. Now, we are at 841, and as much as I would love to do some Q&A, um, I do have to wrap up so I can prepare for the, the podcast that I'm going to do. So uh, with that being said, if you do have questions I'm, from today, like topic specific from today, what I will do is uh, I'm going to post a link in the, um, in the group chat in Telegram where you can ask a question and then I will do my best to either answer it in the Telegram or answer it on next week's um next week's lesson. Now, next week is going to be really good because we're going to be discussing Jesus's baptism and we're going to be looking into the Trinity a little bit, one of our core doctrines. So that being said, I'm going to just say a quick prayer and we will sign out. Um, so Father God, thank you so much for the time that we got to spend together. I know it's cut short a little bit today, but I appreciate everybody who is on here and who gives their time to learning your word and learning how to deepen their relationship with you and, and to better understand the Bible. Um, I want to pray that you bless them as they go out for the rest of this week, for the rest of Holy Week, and that you encourage them to invite people to church or at least share the good news with their friends and family and emulate John the Baptist to the extent that they're able to in their lives and just be a reflection of a group of people who are preparing the way for the King of Kings to come back and reign. Uh, we're praying that you keep them safe, you keep them healthy this week, and that they have a great time with their church family and that, again, you just open up opportunities for them to invite others to hear the good news. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Thank you so much, God, for allowing us to do this and come together. Amen. All right, guys, God bless, and I will see you next week. Thank you so much. Oh, Gio, if you could uh, stop the recording, that'd be great. <laughs>